Hey guys, welcome to chapter 4, topic 2. In this topic, we're going to talk all about how proteins work and are controlled. And this is in a supplement in addition to how we talked about what they how proteins are formed. So this is how they actually go about working once they've been folded properly. So for this topic, we're going to talk about how proteins work and then how they're controlled. This is a main aspect of proteins, so it's really important that you understand these. Here are the topic objectives for this topic. As I said before, these topic objectives are different than the topic objectives for topic 1 and topic 3. So make sure you understand and look at the differences between the lists because they're very different. And all of these are very important and things that should be understood and, and ready to be evaluated for on our next exam. So first, we're going to talk about how they work. And in this, we're going to talk about an overview of how proteins function. We're going to talk about two key examples, antibodies and enzymes. I know you just can't get enough of enzymes, so we're going to talk some more about enzymes. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how drugs work on proteins, and we're going to talk about some added protein function that comes along with that. So proteins at the most basic level function like a um, with a pocket with a ligand and a sub or with a ligand in a binding pocket on the protein. And you can see that here. This binding site is not on the surface of the protein. It's a, this cavity that's formed from the surface. So it's not like a flat area that's bound. It's a, it's an in-depth area and that you can see here. And these ligands are really specific for that binding site as you can see from the image here. And it's more specific than even just shape. We're talking about how those amino acids, those R groups are interacting with each other. Remember that that kinetics is a huge role in how long these substrates and these, um, pro, uh, these enzymes are bound together. So it's really important to understand that because if one amino acid in the ligand changes, the binding strength may be different and that's going to alter the KM, which alters the Vmax, which alters the downstream effects of this enzyme. So it's really important to understand where that binding site is and how those roles play together. So this image it talks about that a little bit more and you can see here how there's a big role in those R groups when you can see them different in the um, colored areas and so if those R groups change at all the electrostatic attractions and um, the bonds are going to change. For example if we were to change one of these hydrogen bonds to a covalent bond that's going to significantly increase the length of time that this ligand is bound to this protein. So it's important you understand how that works or vice versa if we were to break apart some of these hydrogen bonds and not allow those to be present the and the ligand's not going to bind to the enzyme for nearly as long. So make sure you understand how that works and how miscoding can change the way either the enzyme or the ligand depending on what is being changed um, in, the in the interaction. So one of our key examples, and I'm sure you've heard about this in other classes, is antibodies. And antibodies bind to foreign invaders. And then those that for, um, or in the case of autoimmune diseases, they bind to something that's being produced by the body. And these are called antigens. So antibodies bind to antigens. And these are highly, highly specific binding sites. And you can see that here at the end of the structure with these finger-like protrusions. That is the antigen binding site. And as I said, it's very specific. And we actually use the specificity of antibodies to our advantage in the lab. And we'll use them to detect different proteins um, by attaching um, light sensors or HRP to the end of them so that we can detect those on western blots and things like that. But that's how these antibodies work is they have all these other proteins that go into the structure of the antibody but the distinct um, binding site is what is, is what makes an antibody specific for a specific antigen to the point where even different versions of flu viruses depending on how different they are may not be recognized by the same antibody. And we also said we we're going to talk about enzymes as another key example of proteins and their function. And here we are back at enzymes. Now, first of all, if um, you haven't caught on yet, the key to recognizing enzymes by name is that they always have an ASE at the end. So as you can see here on this chart, we have a whole bunch of ASEs. Now, I don't expect you to know the names of or memorize all these enzymes here, but I want you to be familiar with some of them um, and at least start to get a hint of them. And usually enzymes are named pretty quick, um, pretty closely to what their function is. For example, protease. Protease is responsible for breaking down proteins, whereas nuclease is responsible for breaking down nucleic acids. So just be familiar with that nomenclature a little bit so that you have a sense of it so that if you were to see one, you may know... Um, immediately what that function is without even hearing, being, having heard of that protein before. 
So let's look at an example of how enzymes function. And in this case, we're talking about lysozyme. Lysozyme is responsible for breaking down carbohydrates. And so we have a couple steps here, and I'm going to walk you through this graphic a little bit. But I want you to make sure that you really understand how this is working and what you're seeing here. So first of all, we have the um, substrate plus the enzyme. And those come together to form what is known as the ES. And so that ES is where the substrate and the enzyme is still together. Once that enzyme starts to break down the substrate, that becomes the EP, which is the enzyme and the product. And then it'll separate into the E and the P, which is the enzyme plus the product. So how does this work exactly? Well, let's look at the bottom part where you can see the actual chemical structures going on so you can see how this works. So what will happen here is the enzyme substrate complex if it forces the shape of these two um, sugars to change a little bit. What that does is it changes the activation energy needed and makes these sugars more likely to break apart from each other. So that's how this is working. So make sure you understand how this works and how a classic example of an enzyme functions. But it's more than just breaking bonds. Enzymes do a whole lot of other things. And there's three common examples, and I really want you to understand these, is that there are three methods of catalysis that enzymes work with. They work to put two molecules together that maybe wouldn't normally go together. They work to... Um, rearrange the electrons on the substrate which creates a different reaction aspect of that substrate and then they'll strain those bonds to help break the bonds. So those are the three things. They'll put two together, they'll rearrange things within the substrate and they will um, strain the bonds so that they will break. Drugs target enzymes. It's one of the main targets of drugs when we talk about pharmacological um, targets. We also have um, Besides enzymes, the main target for drugs in the body are receptors, which are also mainly proteins. So be familiar with that, especially for those of you who are interested in going into pharmacy. You need to know proteins because proteins are the targets for drugs, either as receptors or as enzymes. But here's a couple examples. Now every drug works differently, so I don't expect you to go crazy memorizing them all. But I want you to see how one example works here. In this case, Gleevec, which is an anti-cancer drug, will actually bind to the oncogenic kinase, which turns it off. And you can see that here, where it sits right in that active site, so ATP can't bind anymore, so that the um, signal for cell proliferation no longer can happen, and the leukemia is then turned off. And that's just one example. So now let's move into a little bit more about proteins um, being controlled. But before we get there, we need to mention one more thing, is that proteins can form complexes with other molecules. We talk a lot about protein-protein interactions, but they can also form examples with inorganic molecules. They can form, um, form complexes with carbohydrates and lipids. So it's really important that you understand that. And a common example is um, heme. Um, heme can bind with... Um, combined with hemoglobin, which then allows for the hemoglobin molecule to carry oxygen. It's the actual heme that's what's combining to that oxygen. And there's a lot of different examples, and I don't expect you to memorize all of them, but I do want you to be aware that that happens, and these things can work in concert with each other to perform the function that they need to serve. So now let's talk about how proteins are controlled. And we have a lot of different types of controls. We have feedback loops, allosteric inhibition, phosphorylation, GTP molecular switches, motor proteins, protein machines, and covalent modification. All of these are very important, so it's important that you understand how these work, and we're going to go through each of these examples. So let's start with feedback loops. Feedback loops are one of the most common ones in the cell. And feedback loops can be as simple as the ones you learned about in uh, 201 or one of your earlier biology classes, where, for example, like we have here, B goes to X, goes to Y, goes to Z. Once Z is made, the feedback goes back and turns us off. And so then the product would continue towards C. That's a really simple example it can get a lot more complicated. For example, this is an example of how cells will determine which, um, which amino acids need to be produced within the body. And you can see how different things are determining how the process is going to flow to what production of what amino acid. And all of these, in this example, are negative feedback loops to an extent. They're positive in the fact that they are turning on other ones when certain ones are turned off, but they're somewhat complex. Then we have very complex, and this is actually more of the case than a common feedback system 
situation. And I don't expect you to memorize any of these loops. I just want you to be aware of how this works. So as you can see here in this image, there are things that when they're turned on, other things are turned off. And when things are turned off, they're turned on. So it's really important to understand how this works. And this is just one small example. This is in cellular apoptosis pathways. But there can be many more pathways within the body that um, are just are enormous. So it's important to understand that feedback loops can do all sorts of stuff. And more importantly, as a researcher, it's important to understand that if we target a protein or we're turning off a process, either by targeting that enzyme or that receptor, chances are something else in the cell is going to be turned on um, because the cell is full of safety. Um, features to help make sure that things continue happening. And that's something else is that another aspect of it is that if we turn it off, what else are we turning off? We may be turning off this one pathway, but what other pathways are we altering? So anytime we introduce drugs or we're changing any kind of system, it's really important to understand what else we possibly could be targeting within the cell. So besides feedback loops, and allosteric inhibition works with feedback loops, um, is allosteric inhibition. And this is where we literally, um, or the cell will even literally go in and turn off a, an enzyme by binding to it that changes the conformational shape so that the active site is no longer available. And you can see that here in this slide where the CTP is binding to the um, the allosteric sites, which then turn off that active site. So the active site's no longer present, so it can't bind to that substrate, and this deactivates enzymes. And this is a way that feedback loops work, and it can also work independently depending on what it is, but it's almost always associated with a feedback loop. Another way that we turn on or off enzymes is phosphorylation. And this goes back to that ATP we were talking about where we chop off one of the phosphate groups and it is added to an enzyme or another protein and that can turn it on or turn it off. Now, it's important to remember we always think that by adding the phosphate group we turn on the protein. That's not always the case. Sometimes adding the phosphate group will turn off the protein. So it's important to understand that just because we phosphorylated something doesn't mean that we... Um, that we've turned it on. And by doing this, we use an enzyme called protein kinase, which is adding the, phosphor, uh, the phosphate group to the um, enzyme or the target protein. To remove the phosphate group, we use an enzyme known as protein phosphatase. So phosphatase removes it, kinase adds it. And kinases are always doing that. So anytime you see a kinase, there's several types of kinases. We have serine, threonine, and tyrosine kinases. And these are the main ones that help move that energy around to help encourage these reactions to occur. So it's really important that you just understand the basic concepts of how phosphorylation works. GTP molecular switches are also very similar. Um, they, instead of using ATP, we use GTP. And GTP will bind directly to the enzyme. Remember, last time we had the kinase that was transferring. In this case, GTP is turning on. And it acts as a switch. And as you can see here, in this example, we go from GTP, where we're active, we have lots of activity going, to GTP, where it's slowing down. Once the GTP comes off, it's off. And so this allows for a little bit of a control in this rate as well. So just be aware the GTP is slightly different than the ATP um, phosphorylations, but they are kind of a similar idea. Let's talk about motor proteins. Motor proteins are really important in the cell. These actually move things from place to place. And it will move um, molecules that are needed for respiration from one place to another. It'll move other um, proteins around. It'll move building blocks around. There's lots of different things. Moving pro uh, chromosomes is a key example when we're go getting ready for um, cell division by moving chromosomes. That's how these motor proteins will do that. Muscle contraction works on multiple cells at the same time, and that's also a motor protein example. Now, how do we ensure that these motor proteins work in the right direction? It's all about conformational shifts, and it's all through the binding sites. And you can see an example here of how we force these motor proteins to move in one direction. By the ATP binding to this, and as that phosphate group comes off, it moves that back leg forward, allowing the um, protein to take a step forward. And that creates that forward movement. So there's really no way for it to move backwards because it's not like you or I where we have independent function. The conformational shifts can only go in one direction. Protein machines are amazing. Um, you've already talked about them in your 201 class to an extent with ATP synthase. It's one of the classic examples of a protein machine. It has 10 or more proteins in the complex, and it works in a very ordered process to create a result, and it, it always has to use energy. The 
would so complex there's no way that this is something that happens in an energetically favorable environment so it's really important to understand that but these are amazing things and more and more common than we ever talk about we never talk too much about proteins and complex or protein machines um except for some key examples as i said like atp synthase because we almost always are talking about focusing on one or two but these machines are what help drive a lot of the functions of the cell. So let's make sure you understand that protein machines can do a lot of really complicated things and allow for that functioning that you and I know and appreciate every day that gets us out of bed in the morning. One last thing about controlling proteins is covalent modification. And we use proteins um, in a, we covalent modify proteins in a variety of ways to get what we want. For example, I've already talked about um, ubiquitination. If we, ubiquitin if we put a ubiquitin molecule on a protein, it signals that that protein is ready for degradation, either because it's misfolded, we have too many of them, or it's just, it's reached the end of its lifespan. There are other types of modifications as well. And so it's important to understand how those modifications work, and we're not going to go into too much detail here as to what those modifications are because we are going to talk about that a little bit later in the semester but at the same time it's we're still not sure we still don't understand exactly how these covalent modifications are impacting the cells um, the UPS system is one that we have worked out pretty well but beyond that we're still moving through all them um, and but they can't we do know what some of the modifications do do they help um, signal that proteins need to bind they also signal for movement either this protein needs to go to the nucleus or this protein needs to go to the membrane and that and we'll talk about that when we talk about transport within the cell much later in the semester um, but we're pretty sure there's actually a lot more covalent modifications that we're just not familiar with how they're occurring within the cell so this is the end of topic two. I know we went through a lot of stuff and we did it kind of fast. So make sure you let me know if you have any questions. Make sure you go through those topic objectives and I will see you in class.